Here we are, day seven of Blue Bombers training camp and really excited to introduce somebody you're gonna see a lot here on Bonfire Sports, Jeff Hamilton of the Winnipeg Free Press. Hammer, how's it going? DB, good to be here. Great to be outside. What a you know, beautiful weather, nice little wind here to break some of that 30 plus degree uh, temperatures that we've had. It's just, uh, like you said, man, day seven, week into this camp. It's been a long wait and just happy to be here overall. Yeah, it feels really good to be back to football, and I know uh, people out there watching are really happy to be talking real football once again. Of course, Jeff will join me for our flagship show here on Bonfire Sports, and that's CFL 360 launching as the season begins right here on YouTube. And uh, yeah, looking forward to that as well. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of things uh, on the show this year. Yeah, man. I mean, this is you know this is a real opportunity, right? It, the whole changing landscape, moving to video, moving to YouTube, moving to you know fan interaction it's a really exciting opportunity to not just talk obviously storylines uh issues around the league it's not just going to be limited to to winnipeg here it's going to be a, a league-wide kind of scope and uh you know me man i mean we're going to have lots of opinions i'm going to have lots of opinions we're going to you know debate you know finally take some of those debates we have off camera on so exciting news exciting opportunity and uh yeah just looking forward to it when we uh you know when we finally get get up and running it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun. Of course, uh, appreciate everybody who has been uh, supporting the channel. Be sure to subscribe. Hit the bell down below. You'll be alerted as soon as we have fresh content uh, up here on Bonfire Sports. I want to touch on uh, a few of the key storylines going into the 2021 season, Jeff. And, well, really, I think with this team being the defending Grey Cup champions, it's been 20 months since uh, that all went down uh, in November of 2019 in Calgary. Where should expectations for the Blue Bombers, in your opinion, be this year? This is a very veteran team. So many pieces coming back, but also some key changes. You know, it's an interesting question, right? Because expectations every year for every team should be high to fans, right? I mean, they want they want their team to do well. There's, you know, in this league, especially with the break, with how few teams there are, you know, to suggest kind of like a growing pains year in the Canadian Football League is kind of a, you know, it's 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 not really often done. So like especially with this team as you mentioned, you know, winning the Great Cup, obviously that being, you know, two seasons ago in 2019 but as you mentioned a lot of the same bodies i don't see why the expectation shouldn't be high um there's obviously some caveats to that there this is a, a a veteran team as you mentioned a lot of returning players um on both sides of the ball and all three phases of the ball including special teams um but they're older players and that's kind of that's kind of the question health has been a big topic heading into camp how are these guys going to be able to how, how do these guys deal with the the extended break as we've seen kind of through camp so far there's been a couple injuries nothing crazy drastic at this point um, but that just all goes into saying as long as this team should can stay healthy they should be good and they should be competing for that top spot in the west and and repeating that great cup championship from 29 19. i don't think those are unrealistic expectations uh you know those are the expectations of head coach mike o'shea and his staff um it's certainly the expectations of the players so i don't see why it shouldn't be the expectations for us and, and the fans yeah i tend to agree i think really with any team if you can stay healthy and be healthy it's going to be an interesting season just 14 games this team should be in the running of the top two teams in the league, Hamilton, Calgary, Saskatchewan. I think all those teams are in there with Winnipeg to potentially push. A lot of hype around the Toronto Argonauts this year, uh, as well as Vernon Adams Jr. And, and Kahari Jones, that quarterback head coach duo in Montreal. I'm unsure about the Edmonton Elks. A lot of change over there. The BC Lions, can Michael Riley carry that team? A lot of change there with a new head coach and Rick Campbell. The West is going to be wild. Yeah, you know what, and it's 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 funny too, right? The West is always kind of wild. It's always it's always a you know a wicked race. When you have teams that are expected to be in the bottom, whether it's the Edmonton Elks or the BC Lions, I mean BC has Mike Riley. They've claimed to have a better O line this year to protect him. That's priority number one. They kind of figured things out at the end of 2019, just fell short um, in in kind of trying to chisel out that obviously that final playoff spot. Um, the Elks are an interesting conversation. I think. I believe that Trevor Harris has got something special this year. I think he will be the X factor for them, obviously being the quarterback and the best player on their team. But, um, you know, I'm not as – I think they are kind of the, you know, the, a little bit of the wild spot in the in the wild, wild west. And, and you know, you kind of alluded to it, but the East has gotten better. You know, I mean, it, for a long even, – even in 2019, I mean, it was all about Hamilton. Yes, Montreal, you know, came out of that – break of uh you know that that i think it was four years they hadn't made the the playoffs they kind of you know were 
whether they were inspired by you know the coaching of Kahari Jones or the play of Vernon Adams, as you mentioned. Um, I think they're going to be an interesting outfit this year. How can they, they? They got a lot of players that are not there from 2019, particularly on defense. How are they going to? How are they going to? You know, deal with those kind of holes. And you know, I, I just I think it's going to be really a competitive year you know and i don't know how many years we've been able to kind of say that you know and so you know especially with whether you want to call it the great equalizer this extended this extended layoff you know and injuries and stuff we see what happened in saskatchewan with the four torn achilles i mean um we'll see what happens and that's the exciting part of every season whether you know your expectations for your particular team are high or not anything can happen and so i think it's uh, that's kind of one of the the biggest exciting things about this year is not just the return of the league but how is everyone going to look because everyone's had to deal with their own obstacles over this prolonged off season and that of course leads into one of the major storylines of blue bombers training camp through the first week here, and that's the health and wellness physically of Andrew Harris. Now, he was a participant in the first three days, left early. Head coach Mike O'Shea stated uh, that Harris had an appointment he couldn't miss, but there he was watching on day four, five, six, and, and now seven. Um, so uh, for Andrew Harris, Mike O'Shea says he needs a couple weeks, doesn't want him to practice. I'm led to believe that this team would have Andrew Harris in the lineup if, say, they had a game this week. He would make himself ready to go. How do you feel about managing the 34-year-old who, yeah, it's been a long layoff, but led the league in rushing in each of the last three seasons, in addition to catching a lot of passes as well. He's had a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there is some logic to easing him into camp or, or to giving him rest and, you know, whether you want to call it load management or, or whatever. Um, I'm not really buying the whole ease in to camp right now. I mean, this guy's 34 years old. Yes, he's, he has the resume. He has the leash not to get you know, obviously release, but like to get that break, right? A lot of these guys do not have that opportunity. If you're not on the field, you're probably gone. So, you know, obviously this is a is a thing that's afforded to him, just given what he's been able to do in this league and particularly with this team. But look, he's 34 years old. He's a fantastic player. He still, like every other guy, needs a training camp to get ready for the season. You know, I mean, Andrew admitted himself, focus in this prolonged offseason was not always football. I mean, he has a lot of things going on in his life. He's got, you know, he's been working towards that life after football for, for quite some time. I mean, he's got his business dealings. He's got his other opportunities out there. And, you know, to hear him say his focus were on those things for a good chunk of the offseason lets you know that he wasn't, you know, wasn't going to just ride the wave like a lot of players expecting right. for this year to come back. So his absence here this week, I mean, I'm not playing it off like, I'm, I don't buying, I guess, the idea that this is some kind of, you know, he doesn't need to do drills, he doesn't need to do that stuff. I mean, he's obviously banged up. I mean, there's an issue here in the first few days. I mean, there, this appointment that we've heard about, you know, I mean, that's, guys don't leave for appointments unless they're, you know, serious. It's so probably like, an appointment with the massage table. Well, it's just something, yeah, something to do with that. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's football life and there's reasons to leave, right? I mean, he didn't have a baby. So, you know what I mean? There, there only is so many things you leave during a practice for. So, and the fact that he's, that, that they've come out and said two weeks. Yeah. Okay. Give me a break. You know what I mean? Like they don't give a guy a two week break from camp and then just expect him to play. I mean, to your point, you know, would he play if they could? Maybe, but they'd probably play him and he'd be out longer. You know what I mean? Because right. he's got to get hit. So I do think this is concerning. Is it concerning in the sense that he's not going to be ready for August 5th? No. I think that's the exact reason why they're sending him out two weeks. Because if you, you know, when you cover this league, you cover sports long enough, there's a big question that gets asked whenever a guy gets an injury. And it's, will him being on the field participating make it worse? Because at the end of the day, you got to make a decision on an injury. We're talking about training camp. This isn't week ten. This, you know, this isn't the, stre the final stretch leading into playoffs. This is training camp. So, obviously, that question is, he would, you know, it would get worse if he if he participated. So, I guess the hope in all this is that if he can take the two weeks, do other things that you know can help him out on the physical side, and get ready. Hopefully by week one, you know, he's a full participant and everything we're talking about leading into this training camp with his injuries or whatever is going on is kind of a moot point. Yeah, well said, Jeff. And with Andrew Harris out, Johnny Augustine also nicked up. He has not participated in camp as well. They've signed an American running back, uh, but it leaves two healthy Canadians uh, getting all the work. That's 2021 draft pick Kyle Borsa, but more uh 
centrally, it is 2019 draft pick Brady Oliveira getting those first team reps. And I know with 2019, his rookie season uh, ending early because of a kind of a nasty uh, uh, broken leg, uh, Brady Oliveira, uh, you heard from him here on Bonfire Sports just the other day, uh, pining to get on the field and, and show what he can do. But that all leads into maybe the biggest area of turnover and change in this Blue Bombers team going into 2021, Jeff, and that's the offense. Not only do you have a quarterback, in Zach Kolaris that now has a training camp and he doesn't just have to focus on, you know, prepping for a game the next week. He can now kind of absorb things and, and be the leader and, and be the, um, the the man at the controls from day one here in training camp with the new offensive coordinator in Buck Pierce. Of course, Buck has been here before and the protege to Paul Apolis learning under him over the last number of years, but it's now Buck's show. This offense could look different. It could look similar. Where's your gauge on that? You know, I think it's going to have elements of it. Uh, you know, there's a couple things in there, obviously. Let's start with the question as far as the offense. I mean, Buck Pierce, yes, he is a rookie offensive coordinator, but he has been with this team for years, obviously starting off as running backs coach and quarterbacks coach the last few years. This guy has a better relationship with the players than I would argue, maybe up there with Mike O'Shea. I'm not going to say that he had a better relationship with the players than Mike O'Shea, and I'm not, you know, this isn't a, you know, anything against Paul Apolise, who was obviously a, an artist with this offense and, and saw guys like Matt Nichols break out, certainly took Andrew Harris's game to the next level. But there is that deep connection between Buck Pierce and these players, and these players would go through a wall for him. There's no, absolutely no doubt about it. And the benefit for him is he's got an opportunity to learn under Paul Apolis for all these years. So he knows exactly what goes into Paul Apolis's day-to-day, how he approaches the offense, the questions he asks. And you get a bit of that when you talk to Buck. I mean, he's talked about, you know, and he says it's cliche or it sounds like a broken record, but, you know, him saying that the players are going to dictate the offense is exactly what Paul Apolis used to say. And it's not just right. dictate the offense for the season, but dictate, dictate the offense week to week, depending on who's in the lineup who's healthy, what the opposing defense looks like. So he has had that, you know, learning on the fly mentality with Paul, uh, Paul Lapolis as, as, you know, running this offense as him being the understudy. And we all know that he's turned down jobs across the league because he wants to stay here in Winnipeg. So I'm expecting this offense to not necessarily be similar in a lot of ways, because as we talked about, how important is Andrew Harris going to be to this offense? Maybe that's not the exact question. How much of a role is he going to have into the offense? Because as we know, the last few years under this successful running game and all this stuff, Andrew Harris has been a massive piece of the puzzle. That also was a, you know, an, an, a, not an indictment to Matt Nichols, but we know he doesn't have that, you know, that skill to necessarily run on the fly, throw deep balls. This was a very, you know, tick, tick, tippity tackety kind of, you know, offense where you'd give it to 33 and, and you know, he kind of makes his magic done. I think with Zach Caleros under the controls, as we saw late in last season and then all the way through the playoffs, is this guy's got some actual, you know, I don't say actual athletic ability. Of course, Matt Nichols does too. He's got a different tool set that allows him not only the arm, but the skill to, you know, extend plays with his legs to then fire on the go rather, rather than, you know, Matt Nichols was very risk averse and which was a very important element of the Bombers offense. Not to suggest that Zach Claris is going to be reckless with this group, but it opens up the book a bit. And I think when you look at some of the receivers with Kenny Lawler coming in, feeling more comfortable, obviously with Darvin Adams wanting to rebound for maybe an offseason in 2019 and some of the other pieces, whether it be Cam Meredith, um, you know, Rasheed Bailey, obviously Drew Wolitarski, there's, there's that chemistry already kind of built in to make those guys a little bit more impactful game to game and maybe take a little bit of pressure off of that, uh, off of Andrew Harris um, in this group. So, you know, whether or not it's completely different, whether or not it's a little bit different, I think Buck Pierce is going to make it, you know, put his stamp on this team. And I think we're going to see an exciting creative offense, not just over the year, but from week to week. Yeah, and in no way is this a Matt Nichols punching bag party, but I'll say it. Zach Kolaris has a better arm. He's more athletic. Some of those things you touched on. I just think he's a much more dangerous quarterback than Matt Nichols was. And you have a new OC in Buck Pierce. Things could truly open up as far as Andrew Harris and, and how much work he gets through the year. I think it would be smart of the Blue Bombers to have Johnny Augustine, Brady Oliveira, Kyle Borsa, whomever, to get a little bit more work, start lowering that workload on Andrew Harris. When they need him is when it's cold in November and now December. We're going to see two playoff games, including the 108th Grey Cup in Hamilton in December this year. Um, so those things are going to be important. We didn't even talk about the O-line. 
Like, right. that's the other part of the offense, too, right? I mean, that's the built-in package. And you also talked about Zach Kolaros. I keep saying Kolaros, Kolaros. He pronounces it right. I probably never will. But the O-line has been the biggest piece of Matt Nichols' success, of Andrew Harris's success, and will be a massive piece of Zach's success with this offense. And getting that run game and getting him the time he needs to extend those plays, to throw downfield, that is a massive piece of the puzzle um, that is intact, ultimately, in full this year. Yeah, certainly. Here's the craziest thing I found coming into this season. Of course, all the storylines around the long layoff, no 2020 season, all of these veterans coming back. But when's the last time you entered a training camp, Jeff, and one of the main storylines is at kicker? We're moving on, the Blue Bombers are, from maybe the greatest of all time in a future Hall of Famer in Justin Medlock to a true rookie, a 2020 draft pick out of Western University in Mark Leggio. We'll see what Mark Leggio has when they're on the field. That's when it's obviously going to really tell the story on him. But what's your take on the team's level of confidence that a young guy who's never kicked professionally before is the only guy in camp? I'll say this. Mark Leggio really impressed me with his his media you know availability when you know because it was interesting to see what you know what was between the ears. Kickers are a big it, it's a big mental game, and I'm not saying his charisma that he that he expresses is, is going to you know necessarily translate into him booting you know big field goals at big moments, but it kind of eased a little bit from my take on on where this guy's head was at. Could he handle the pressure of joining his first pro camp? You know you know. Um, getting in there with the guys, kind of introducing himself. There's a, a little bit of confidence that is required to do that. And I mean, I know you're kind of on your own. You do your own business. He's got Mike Benson as his long snapper. You got to have that relationship. I mean, that's kind of your little group and you kind of, you know, stay away from the team maybe, but he does have that confidence. So that was kind of my first impression. You know, he asked me, what does it mean? I think it's, I think it's fascinating. I, there obviously is a lot of confidence in him right there's a lot of confidence in him not just as a kicker but as a puncher too you know as a kickoff guy I mean he's going to be doing all the duties because he's literally the only kicker here so unless they bring somebody in or see something that they don't necessarily like with him this is the guy that they're rolling with now yes is that a vote of confidence a massive vote of confidence but I also think it is a massive change in philosophy from this team because for years Medlock was a big piece of the puzzle. Like he he was he was yeah. the guy that, you know, you needed to bring back. He was the guy that put points on the board every time, you know, a a a drive would stall. I mean, he's won games for this team multiple times. In fact, the year before they, you know, they picked up Medlock, they were talking about all the misses they had and losing games by two points, one point, three points, and missing field goals throughout the game or not being able to trot their field goal guy out to kick those, you know, in, in those situations. So we, we, and they also invested a massive piece of, of, of change to, to, to Justin Medlock, who was making, he wasn't making 200 grand, but he wasn't making too far off it either. So, you know, this is obviously a cost cutting thing as well. They, they, they have a vote of confidence in him, but they're not paying him nearly as much as they were paying Justin Medlock. And now there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a hoping game that you hope that, you know, he, he, he's progressing. You hope that he, you know, the, the, the lights don't get too bright when it's a pro game. Yes. He's had a great, he had a great career at the university of Western, um, uh, you know, this is a, those are definitely indicators that he could get it done at this level, but there are no guarantees. So as much as I think this guy is, you know, he's smart, he's, he's, he's charismatic, he's obviously got some skill. This is a massive piece of the puzzle that is still hasn't been determined and won't be determined without pre with, with no preseason games until it really matters. Right. So that's the intriguing part to me. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see how he deals with camp, but more importantly, it'll be interesting to see how he handles that his new role week one when they're up against the uh, against the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Yeah, and that game's going to be awesome. August 5th, we now know uh, capacity crowd is possible. The team has been clear. They want people to arrive early uh, if you're able to on game day, uh, but that that's really when it's all going to begin. As Willie Jefferson put it, could you have a better game one for the return of Canadian football than Thai Cats and Blue Bombers, number one offense versus the number one defense, uh, as Willie Jefferson says in this league. Uh, it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, for you out there, you're going to see a lot more of this here on Bonfire Sports as the season continues. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit all those buttons down below. Like, subscribe, hit the bell hit us up in the comments let us know what you want us to uh, kind of dive into and dissect here uh, as Blue Bombers training camp continues um, but 
it's going to be a fun year and uh, looking forward to you all joining us for the ride. For Jeff Hamilton, I'm Darren Bombing. Thanks for logging on to Bonfire Sports. We'll see you next time.